Okay, so today's session, you know, we are looking at covering learning outcome three, which is basically be able to. So in be able to, we have to practically show that we are able to understand something and we have to, you know, show the application of the concept that we have learned. In learning outcome one, as you can see, and in also in two, you saw that we have to understand. That means you have to develop a knowledge and you have to, you know, basically study theoretically some of the concepts to understand what is business ethics, what is CSR, what is corporate governance and ethical behavior. But in the third learning outcome, we have to put it to practice. That means we have to show the application of what we have understood and we are able to use it by giving a practical example. So here, the idea would be to understand, be able to analyze complex issues of CSR and corporate governance. So we covered corporate governance yesterday and they have included CSR from learning outcome one. So basically speaking, learning outcome three is going to ask you to take an example and show how corporate governance issues are dealt by organization and how CSR issues are dealt again by organization. And we have to do this by actually taking up an example in this learning outcome. And that is where we will be able to show that we have understood and it is be able to. That means I am able to actually apply what I have learned from learning outcome one and two. And I can uh, take up an example of an organization to show uh, and review corporate governance. And I can take up an example to recommend, you know, CSR uh, problems. If the company has problems with corporate social responsibility, then I can recognize that problem and I can make some recommendations on how the company can actually improve these issues of corporate governance and CSR uh, in their organization. So learning outcome three, as you know, we did spend a lot of time yesterday, but here some of the bits we have already covered. So what we are going to do is go through them, but maybe in slightly more detail. So we covered, you know, the concept of CSR, how it originated, we looked at the first report, which is the Cadbury report, which came out in 1992, followed by the Greenberry report. So we'll understand some of these reports and what is the significance of these reports. But here in this learning outcome, what we are going to use is use one of the reports to apply this in an organization and solve their problem of governance or solve the problem of CSR. So basically, the learning outcome is focused on identifying solutions. We have to look at uh, you know, talking about problems which companies face and what kind of solutions they can seek or get from corporate governance and application of CSR in the organization. Now, in order to cover this, obviously what I've done first is we have looked at a bit of a summary, uh, you know, by a flow chart to understand what is corporate social responsibility. So this is something that we covered yesterday, uh, but very briefly, you know, it talked about what CSR means because the company is looking at being focused on sustainability, environmental development, you know, uh, look at work life balance, look at negating the effects of globalization. And those responsibilities, when companies actually include in their day to day operation, they say that they are actually looking at maintaining or coming clean on or at least having targets on CSR. Now, in order to understand CSR, we need to know. The Carroll's framework, which is the uh, the pyramid, you know, which is which takes into account four accountability for the business, which include economic, legal, social, and philanthropic, and then we divide CSR into three different types, which is looking at the route through stakeholders, which is employees, partners, suppliers, board of directors, you know, other companies or government and things, uh, and then we also look at, uh, you know, corporate citizenship in some cases, and we look at stakeholder ownership, which is defining and differentiating the shareholders from the internal and external shareholder uh, stakeholders within the organization. And then further division can be done in order to understand, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility. The second learning outcome focused on corporate governance. So this flowchart actually summarizes what are the approaches which are available and valid globally. So if you recall, we spoke about rules-based approach, which is in the US, and we talk about principle-led approach, which is based in Europe and UK countries, or UK, uh, you know, UK and in general, European countries. And this allows the companies to develop their own code of practice, code of conduct, which follows the clear principles or, you know, guidelines which have been set out 
in terms of corporate governance. So <clears throat> from our perspective, what we need to be able to do is now look at understanding what are the various you know, factors which contribute towards uh, corporate governance and various factors which contribute or basically give rise to the question of what is called corporate social responsibility. So when we talk about, you know, uh, companies facing, uh, you know, companies basically wrongly reporting their finances, when we look at scandals, when we look at frauds, when we look at misreporting of, you know, financial information. So this is not new. This has been happening since the 19th century. People have, uh, you know, in different points in time, looked at reporting or doing or committing fraud, reporting misinformation or, you know, exaggerating the financial information for their own personal gains, profits and things like that. But what are the factors which basically contribute to these, uh, you know, uh, problems? These factors include globalization. When companies become too big, they have to deal with different laws and legislations in different countries, in different geographies. And in some cases, sometimes what happens is that the companies do not follow the guidelines which have been set uh, and they then start to look at, uh, you know, flouting some of these guidelines and that can lead to problems in terms of, uh, you know, financial mismanagement. Now, technology, sometimes, you know, you might think that how can technology be a problem? Now, as we know that sometimes organizations use technology. Now, you did one of the modules in your previous qualification, which was Sage for Accounting. Now, if you look at Sage for Accounting as a software, and if the software properties or you know, rules are not updated to be implemented in a particular geography, then you would find that technology can also be a barrier. So if I go to sage.com, as you can see, Sage is approved as an accounting and a payroll package in so many different countries. But if a change is introduced by the government on VAT, for example, or say, for example, on certain uh, important aspects of minimum wage, then if the change is not done in the software, then the companies will actually keep using it. And that would lead to, again, miss. Uh, you know, in representation of information, and that would be considered as wrongdoing by the company because uh, the technology or the software package that they are using is actually not allowing them to, uh, what is this, not allowing them to report, you know, financial data accurately. Then sometimes you look at factors like population. You look at factors like free market. They also contribute towards corporate disasters. So when I look at population, as you would see that, you know, why some of these things in terms of banking frauds or, you know, uh, companies going bust happens globally is that sometimes the operations of the company or the bank become too big. The lending by the banks can become too aggressive. And what happens is it leads to the creation of what is called bad debts. So when you look at Freddie Mac and Freddie Mae, the two big uh, U.S. banks, you know, which or organizations which started to lend uh, and, you know, in, in the mortgage market in the U.S. and had accumulated debts of $2.3 trillion. So these two companies had a lot of lending from lots of different banks globally. NatWest, RBS, Barclays, you look at uh, ABN Ambro, you look at Jordan, you know, uh, Chase, you look at Citibank, there was no bank which was stand chart, HSBC. There was no global bank which was spared because these banks had excessively lent money to these companies without making proper checks. And that meant that the companies were actually, uh, you know, giving out mortgages to people or, uh, you know, people in the U.S. or residents in the U.S., even though they could not afford it. So sometimes volumes and the greed side of things which companies look at progressing with also, you know, creates problems for them, like we've seen in the case of financial crisis, which happened because of these two companies. And it also led to the closure of a couple of very well-known banks like Lehman Brothers and things like that. And then when we talk about, you know, free markets, sometimes what you will see is companies invest into share market bonds or, you know, in trading uh, in stock exchanges, which basically, if left free, that means if it is not checked by rules and regulations, can also then create a major risk for, you know, uh, corporate governance. Because in this case, 
there is no check. The, the checks and balances can fall weak. And because these checks and balances can, you know, uh, if they're not followed and if they are, they are allowed to run, then what tends to happen is most organizations, you know, start becoming greedy and selfish. So what they do is for short-term gains, they will look at providing insider information, which will lead to trading and insider trading. And then that in some cases can actually be detrimental for the business and the operations of the company. So free markets in general, when we talk about the view wherein there is no interference in terms of how companies trade on the stock exchange or various markets. And if the risks are not checked and left unregulated, then what you will see is that this also leads to the creation of corporate disasters or companies going bust, going into administration, uh, getting or you know getting into excessive losses because the expansion or the operations of the companies have not been checked with regards to the law and legislation. Is that okay? So basic background for us to understand why does corporate, why do we see corporations, large companies, small medium companies, sometimes having problems, financial problems, because in some cases, these companies and their operations, you know, does not get checked from a point of view of law, the legislation in that country, and they are allowed to be uh, free, and that means that they can back up losses, uh, you know, uh, for its stakeholders, for its shareholders, and as a result, that you know, the the checks and balances are not there, which means it leads to weaker governance and then companies falling apart. Now, the first assessment criteria that we have to look at basically talks about we need to review CSR. That means we need to pick up a company and we need to look at from an example company uh, reviewing their corporate social responsibility and their corporate governance and recognize what are the issues in that company on CSR and on corporate governance. Now, there are lots of examples which are available between the 19th century and the early 20th century, wherein a lot of companies have had issues with regards to the created policies to follow CSR. But at the end of the day, when we review the policies and we see the output or the outcome that the companies are trying to achieve because they've implemented some of these policies for governance uh, and for corporate social responsibility, we see that they fall short. So here we are going to look at some examples wherein what we see is that some these companies actually implemented CSR policies in their organization, but because of rec reckless, that means careless behavior of implementation of these policies, these companies did not show good corporate governance. And as a result, these companies had either had to face losses or in some cases, you know, these companies had to basically close down. Now, some of the examples, because we have to do review, that means we have to take a company uh, or a named organization in order to discuss this task. So what I've done is I've looked at a couple of examples for you, and some of these companies are quite well known. And the idea is to identify what are the failures they've had in corporate governance, and where do we see that these companies went wrong when we talked about you know, corporate uh, governance. So first company that I've taken as an example is Polypec Collapse, which means this company called Polypec, uh, you know, international uh, as a company, they grew quite quickly in the 1980s. They were a small British textile company, which was listed on the FTSE stock exchange. But, uh, you know, it basically almost, not almost, it closed down in the early 1990s when the when it was discovered that the company has also racked up a debt of 1.3 billion pounds because of gross management and fraud. So in this case, the founding CEO, Asil Nadir, you know, he actually fled to Cyprus in 1993. And what happened was because of the number of scandals and the uh, you know problems the company faced in terms of financial issues, the Cadbury Committee report, which came out in 1992, then as an using this company as an example, came out with a code of conduct for corporate governance. 
which became mandatory for all companies in the UK to follow. So that is why when we look at the Cadbury committee's report uh, or Cadbury report in a sense to the corporate governance, it becomes very important because this is the company which led to the creation of the corporate governance laws or the code of conduct in the UK and in general, you know, across the world when we look at different companies in different uh, places. So the Cadbury report then came, Cadbury committee report then came out with, you know, recommendations and these recommendations, you know, had to be followed and implemented in all companies uh, henceforth in order to avoid these kind of issues wherein, you know, the shareholders ended up losing 1.3 billion pounds worth of, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say money because the company was trading on the stock exchange and that meant that the taxpayer, the shareholders, uh, the employees, the suppliers were uh, in were basically, you know, in the loss because the company collapsed and it basically closed down. Now, what was the end result of it? Obviously, the end result of it is that because of this multi-million pound fraud, the founding CEO Nader, when he was when he returned to the UK, he had to face court court proceedings, and he was found guilty of multi-million uh, theft, which he had done, and he was sentenced to 10 years in pres imprisonment in 2012. So by taking an example of one company, Polypack International, what we have seen is that the company company's financial management was financial side of things was mismanaged, which led to the uh, you know accumulation of debt of 1.3 billion pounds, and that uh, when it was investigated by the Cadbury committee and a report was filed, led to the creation of the first uh, code of corporate governance in the UK. And when this person and the you know court proceedings were tried, this company, you know, the founder CEO was actually jailed for a period of 10 years. Then we look at another example from a different country, not from the UK, but a different country in the Europe, like Luxembourg. And we take up an example of BCCI collapse. So this was a Luxembourg registered bank of credit and commerce international and was founded in 1972 by Aga Hassan Abiti, who was essentially uh, you know, the bank was essentially headquartered in Karachi in London, and this bank, you know, had 400 branches, had assets of 20 billion. It was one of the seventh largest private banks at that point in time when we talk about 1982. And obviously, a lot of irregularities which was found by, uh, you know, in running the operations of this bank, money laundering, and the regulators ended up raiding this bank in seven countries in 1991, which led to the closure of this company. And again, um, you know, the report, which is the uh, Cadbury report, which came out in 1991-1992, used this as an example, saying that, you know, uh, there, were, there were lots of gap areas in the governance and running of the company, which needed to be put into a code of conduct or a framework. And that is what was done when we look at, you know, uh, the Cadbury uh, report, Cadbury committee report. Now, everybody's heard about Enron. It was one of the largest US energy company. Uh, in 2001, it became bankrupt. It was the biggest bankruptcy scandals which has hit our lifetime. The company's, uh, you know, $63 billion uh, worth of asset, you know, mm -hmm. were fraudulently taken away by the chairman and few directors, <laughs> neglected totally by their auditors, which was mm -hmm. one of the big five accounting corporations in the world. And what we look at is that the money actually just disappeared. And as a result, the whole company collapsed. So again, this is an example of a big corporate disaster, which has happened in our lifetime, wherein this is the largest case of bankruptcy with the company losing so much money and going bankrupt, uh, you know, filing for the bankruptcy in the US. And it had assets worth 63 billion and they were all on paper. Uh, actually, the assets were embezzled by the chairman, the few directors within the company, and this is something which the auditors were not able to pick out uh, and report to the authorities on time. And by the time this was discovered, the whole entire money or the wealth, uh, you know, had actually disappeared. So in the subsequent slide, I've given a couple of examples like BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. I don't know how many of us remember that in 2010, there was a big problem or a disaster, an oil spill, which happened in the Gulf of Mexico. And here, Halliburton, 
which was a supplier and operating the platform for BP, British Petroleum. Uh, there was an explosion on the deep water horizon rig, which led to the loss of, I think, 21 lives or odd, uh, if I remember correctly. And it led to a lot of oil leaking into the Gulf of Mexico and, you know, surrounding areas, which created an oil spill and destruct, destroyed the wildlife and you know, the livelihood of a lot of fishermen and, you know, local population. Now, this is one of the most expensive corporate disasters which have happened. So it was 21. Instead of 21, it's 11 lives which were lost because people, when they were working, uh, the oil, this water rig actually exploded and it lost to the, led to the loss of 11 people losing their life. There were fines which was imposed by the U.S. Congress up to $4 billion, and they were further increased and the liability and the compensation bill, which actually BP had to foot over a 10-year period, uh, is 40 billion US dollars, and this is one of the biggest corporate disasters or you know failures which has happened, which led BP to bankruptcy almost to the verge of bankruptcy. So uh, because they were able to reach a settlement with the US government, and this money was basically being repatriated by the profits the company is making or is going to make in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, was the reason why the company actually survived. But the whole management structure, the CEO. Uh, were all replaced because of the handling of this particular disaster, the PR. And it is one of the case studies that we study uh, when we look at, you know, understanding how corporate governance can go wrong within the organization. And then we also look at the global financial crisis. This is something which we, which has happened in our lifetime. So when you look at 2007, 2008, a lot of reckless borrowing and negligence by you know, banks in terms of lending to countries wherein, you know, the economies were not uh, repaying their debt led to what is called the global financial crisis. Obviously, it was part initiated by the collapse of the two big companies, Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac in the U.S., which had led to the accumulation of a lot of toxic debt, as we call it, because the banks were not able to recover that money from the company. Uh, and in turn, the company was not able to recover money or get installments or mortgage payments from its uh, you know, customers. And that meant that the customers did not have the money to pay. In turn, the company did not have any money and they could not return or stick to their interest or you know, repayments, which they had borrowed money from the banks, which led to this whole cycle of you know, the financial crisis across the globe. So with so many different examples that we look at, what we can see is that there are different reasons why uh, we study that you know these disasters or problems have happened with large corporations which are quite profitable they have global operations uh, they have checks and balances in place but because somewhere somehow somewhere down the line the they have dropped the ball in terms of the code of ethics and in terms of the board of directors in particular or the top management senior management in particular did not review the operations of the company and that led to the downfall of these companies or companies going bankrupt or companies actually closing down and these are examples of what we called as uh, what we will say uh, and term as our corporate disasters so when we look at 3.1 if i relate the example of polypec international which is the british textile company which collapsed here the problem in terms of corporate governance would be what would be the problem in, in terms of corporate governance? This company collapsed. So this is an example of financial mismanagement and fraud. Is that okay? When we talk, mm -hmm. about, we yes, talk about corporate, we talk about corporate governance. We look at lots of different types of uh, principles and rules which have been laid out, depending on which geography it is looking at. So if we take this example and review the CSR and corporate governance policy and why the company uh, actually failed, we look at the reasons coming across of corporate governance is gross mismanagement or appropriation of funds and fraud, which is embezzlement of companies' assets and money by the founding director and CEO of the organization. Now, when we go to BCCI, here, what were the reasons of the collapse of the bank? Here, the reasons uh, of the collapse of the bank were basically related to corporate governance, but they specifically were in the re, uh, remit of what is called 
uh, you know, money laundering. And in some cases, this was basically related to, you know, um, let's say reckless spending or, uh, you know, borrowing, which the company was allowed to do, or in this case, the bank had allowed its customers to do, which meant that the money could not be recovered from customers. And this led to substantial losses uh, in terms of, and then finally the closure of the company. So here the corporate governance issue primarily was money laundering. When you go to Enron, what was the main issue where, because of which the, uh, you know, the company collapsed in terms of corporate governance? Fraudulent accounting. So here the accounting practices should have been picked up the wrong reporting of finances, profits, the uh, reporting of you know key financial statements of the company should have actually been these errors should have been picked up or this particular problem should have been detected earlier by the auditors which was arthur anderson but these errors went undetected and as a result because of this misappropriation of uh, assets and fraudulent accounting one of the biggest companies uh, you know one of the biggest bankruptcies that we see has happened in our lifetime and when we look at BP Water Horizon disaster, there are lots of things which actually went wrong for this company. So the, this company, in terms of its CSR, corporate social responsibility, uh, you know, one of the reasons why they were fined heavily was that it basically led to the destruction of the local environment, which is the, uh, you know, the when I, when I say local environment, which means the 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 kind of environmental pollution it created for for the Gulf of Mexico in particular, that was the major problem of corporate social responsibility. So on one side, BP has an agenda that it wants to promote, uh, you know, reduce, say, for example, global warming. It wants to look at cleaner uh, environment in terms of its rigging and drilling of, uh, you know, in drilling platforms to drill for oil. Uh, but it exactly did the opposite, wherein it subcontracted its work to Halliburton, which did not, you know, obviously, and at this stage, the BP, which was the main contractor and, uh, you know, owner and, uh, let's say, the um, uh, had the holding, the license of operating the rig to dig oil in Gulf of Mexico, had actually subcontracted and without proper procedures, service level agreements and checks being put in place, it led to this particular, uh, you know, uh, oil spill, which basically destroyed you know, the local environment and obviously the livelihood of a lot of people, uh, you know, in, in that territory. So this is from a point of view of looking at two, three things. One is that it led to basically manslaughter. That means it led to the loss of life, which was criminal proceedings for which obviously some of the management and key people were convicted. It led to what is called environmental damage. And then finally, last but not the least, it also caused a lot of financial damage to the company because the company had to deal with civil and, uh, you know, criminal cases, which meant that there was lots of compensation payable to parties which had received the damage. And in this case, this is an example that we are reviewing wherein we see, uh, you know, problems at the corporate social responsibility level, which is environment uh, damage. And, uh, you know, when we look at uh, civil and criminal cases, which is leading to the life of uh, de leading to the death, death of you know 11 of its employees, and last but not the least, you know from a corporate governance point of view, because uh, the, the, the amount of compensation this company has had to you know uh, give out, uh, and then the deal that it had to strike with the U.S. Congress in order to keep its operations going, uh, uh, you know only allowed the company to be saved, and that is why this is not just a corporate governance disaster or but it also highlights how corporate social responsibility was neglected by the company which had you know this as as a defined agenda in its you know annual plan annual business plan and then when you look at global business uh, you know financial crisis here we are going to be talking about you know mismanagement of fund excessive lending by the banks uh, no regulatory checks so these were problems which were discovered not just at the individual company level but also at the national and international level because they were successive organizations which failed to detect that over lending and over borrowing would lead to toxic debts and these debts when they are not recoverable would lead to the collapse of the whole financial system uh, globally 
and that led to the uh, you know economic downturn or recession in so many countries uh, you know during that time frame so this helps us cover and uh, you know cover in detail if you take one example and recognize the problem of csr and uh, highlight what is the problem of corporate governance by taking a named organization that would allow you to complete this task is that okay mm -hmm. now let's go across to the second assessment criteria wherein now we know there's a problem now we know what kind of problems can happen because of corporate governance what kind of problems could happen because of corporate social responsibility being neglected we need to look at recommending solutions which would help the company overcome these problems but again what we have to do is basically look at taking a named organization that means a company that we need to look at specifically we cannot talk about it generically okay so here when we talk about recommendations because of the you know one slide which i'd shown last yesterday to you which talked about you know a lot of collapses of organizations which have happened you know in the last uh, 10 years between 1998 to 2008 you would see that there are lots of big names that we see which have actually collapsed uh, or basically you know uh, closed down because of uh, problems related to uh, let's say uh, you know financial mismanagement or uh, you know some sort of neglect which the uh, company's directors or board of directors have not been able to you know look at so let me bring that quick slide up uh, and i can relate it to this particular task i have that slide so this one okay. so when we look at this particular slide which talks about you know the number of corporate scandals that we've seen large scale fraud and scandals that we've seen which have happened between 1998 to 2008 led to what what did they do this led to the creation of code of conduct you know for governance and also for csr and how did the company then look at adopting this into their uh, you know day to day working is what we get to see when the uh, in the us we see this happening because this sox act came out from uh, from the parliament which basically meant that you know all companies had to declare financial mismanagement before the accounts were finalized but when we look at countries or you know look at companies in the in the european region and other places what they did was when these kind of corporate frauds and disasters were discovered way back say in 1990 starting with the polypec example lot of uh, you know investigation and committees which started to bring out report because the government started to intervene and they came out with a lot of successive reports to basically enshrine that means create the code of best practice which companies were given uh, to follow so when we talk about the uh, you know the talk about the um, uh, recommendations that we need to make what we need to be able to do is understand the three or four reports which are uh, which are committee reports which were brought out between the time frame of 1992 to 1998 and these reports essentially set the ball in motion to decide on the code of practice and the code of conduct or the framework for corporate governance and how the organizations need to be held accountable so in this case we look at a particular theory which is called the nudge theory which came out in 2000 and this theory basically was you know proposed by american academics richard thaler and cas sunstein now what they did was when they proposed this theory they basically proposed that an organization which is basically making good decisions would show and exhibit a behavior wherein their employees would be happy uh, you know they will be generating wealth and creating wealth for not just the company its stakeholders its shareholders but also for the community so this is a bit of a theory or a background that we need to understand that when a lot of work was being done uh, these two academics richard thaler and cas sunstein actually came out with this story that the organizations need to uh, you know understand that there is a change versus societal management uh, which which they need to apply in terms of running the day to day operations of the company which essentially meant that 
when company looks at running its day to day operation, it needs to do so in such a way that the employees are happy, the stakeholders are happy, the wealth which is being created by the organization is being done for the benefit of community, for stakeholders, for its employees, and the society in general. And this creates a company which is which shows essentially the operations of the company are following the code of practice or the framework which has been set by, um, you know, which has been set under the corporate governance or the CSR framework. Now, in relation to this, we need to understand the three, four reports which are there. One is the Cadbury Committee Report. Now, the Cadbury Committee Report basically after the Polypack International, uh, you know, disaster or was discovered it made a lot of recommendations to make sure that these mistakes are not happening with the running of large corporations. And they came out with this code of best practice, which is called also called the Cadbury Code of Corporate Governance. Now, this code has been updated quite a number of times, and this code is the first serious template. That means the first attempt by the government's or by you know the uh, let's say the legal bodies in 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 any country to primarily look at setting a code for corporate governance uh, and running of the uh, you know organizations on a day to day basis now there are lots of different things which this report actually recommends but there are some basic codes of practices which you know it recommended and this code of practices are available you know as a pdf document you need to study but the four main codes of practice are that the board of all listed companies registered in the UK should comply with the code of practice which it describes. So when you form a new company in the UK, you know you have to uh, create what is called the memorandum of articles. You have to have, uh, you know, basic, uh, you know, pretext of the documentation which is required. And in that documentation, there is. It is a section which basically talks about the best code of practice which the directors of the company have to follow and they have to create that organization or the operations of that organization. They are actually following this code of practice which is the cabinet. Now, in this report, it also says that companies should give reasons of any non-compliance. So when you submit accounts and if you're not meeting the requirements of submission of the accounts or anything which is a financial irregularity that needs to be reported by the company because that is not that means it is not meeting you know the requirements of uh, you know essentially here uh, the requirements of the um, submission of accounts to say uh, you know company's house now it also talks about that you know some companies need to ensure that they have proper auditing principles in place to meet compliance. So companies should be run some sort of audits every year, and that would mean that these audit principles would allow any such problems, issues which are not meeting the criteria of law, can actually be maintained and rather than towards. And last but not the least, what you will also see. Is that uh, you know in this? So what you will also see is that in this case, the uh, code also recommended that the institutional shareholders, you know, people who are shareholders or stakeholders in that company, should also have a say. And that is where companies are now required, uh, you know, to basically look at getting some clearance to the voting route in the annual general meetings when companies decide to invest or comply or basically you know look at making large scale investments to improve the operation or you know expand the business in a particular geography now there are lots of recommendations so i'm not going to go through all the recommendations which are listed here but they are recommendations that you can go through to understand why the cadbury report uh, you know and what kind of recommendation it made now there are some recommendations which are also related to accounting and financial accounting practices tax practices and compliances which are related to, uh, you know, making sure that it uh, that most companies when they submit accounts, they are meeting the legislation and requirements for companies' house in terms of reporting fraud, money laundering, and you know also looking at things like whistle blowing and bribery, which I covered yesterday in one of the uh, one of the slides. Now, what is the significance of the Cadbury report? That is what we need to understand. 
why why is this report very important when we study the corporate governance and when we study csr now the reason why this report has a lot of significance is because in the private sector this report actually created a landmark by introducing practices which were supposed to be followed and recommendations which were supposed to be followed by the companies when they were looking at the you know uh, listing or running operations in other countries uh, with regards to you know um, uh, their operations so that is why this report is very significant because it is a landmark in terms of you know uh, creating the code of practice or governance which was required especially when companies were actually operating in multiple geographies and this allowed you know the the companies to early detect or uh, you know understand if there were any issues problems which are happening with you know financial mismanagement now the cadbury report was followed by greenberry report in 1995 there were further changes which were recommended to the cadbury report so again uh, and, uh, you know this is the reason why because some of these changes were quite significant that is why this separate report was published and uh, when this report was published you know it made recommendations around how the remuneration of directors in the company has to be done so this report in addition to the recommendations which the cadbury report had made covered uncovered one area which they felt was left out by in the cadbury report is that when we look at considering remuneration of directors what we need to ensure is that the directors remuneration also follows you know some sort of so this was quite important when we look at the greenberry report because its main recommendations and conclusions were around remuneration arrangements which are dealing in specific to the directors of the company and this remuneration arrangements could be include salary pension bonuses stock options because this would mean that the director of the company go is not directly responsible for the uh, operations of the company but is a direct beneficiary of uh, you know what the company's operations are and sometimes you see companies give out uh, excessive bonuses or excessive uh, you know perks and incentive to its directors which basically drains the resources in terms of you know uh, uh, say for example profits or in terms of cash reserves which the company has been able to accumulate because being the director they are the majority stakeholder and they can pass a resolution and obviously ensure that you know these are given to the directors as bonuses salary pensions or stock options then we look at the hampel committee report now this is a report which came out further after the greenberry report in 1998 and this report actually looked at uh you know revisiting some of the recommendations which the cadbury report had made and it also listened into what is called cbi now cbi is a very important body in the uk and it is called the confederations of british industry and what it did was it included recommendations from the cbi in terms of directors remuneration uh, specifically in terms of bringing changes to the directors remuneration in the company and what this report also suggested is that the greenberry report and the cadbury report findings were strongly uh, endorsed that means they had to be followed by the book uh, in in the company's operations or in the formation of new companies so that the misgivings of you know directors remuneration and misappropriation of funds which happened in polypex international case could not be repeated uh, as far as uh, you know the um, uh, operations of the company are concerned now when we look at um, hampel's report it also talks about the role of institutional investors you know big pension funds when we talk about big companies like the government itself issues bonds we will see sometimes large companies uh, which are public sector enterprises they issue bonds and these bonds can be underwritten or traded in the stock market but they are underwritten by the government because they are considered to be quite safe as a instrument and these are long term investments which companies make now one such recommendation made by hampel report was that in the uk you see a lot of large public sector enterprises and they have a gaping hole in terms of pension so when you look at the nhs there is a lot of gaping when i say in in the nhs there is a uh, deficit on pensions 
and this deficit is increasing you know month on month year on year and what the report actually suggests is that when people take out pension or when these companies actually look at investing the money uh, which uh, you know employees are saving in pension funds they need to be done in a way wherein it protects and safeguards you know the um, uh, pension of the customers or pensions of the employees now what most companies do is when they look at working and dealing with pension funds is that they will place these funds or give it to these companies in order to be invested into stock market and whereas what happens is when if companies take aggressive uh, you know risks then sometimes what can happen is because of the losses in the stock market the value or the company uh, the value of these pension funds also decreases and as a result what happens is the customers whose savings have been invested in order to have a certain amount of return when they retire they can get from this pension fund actually gets washed out so this report categorically suggested that the role of in institutional investors like the pension fund needs to be seen with greater scrutiny and there needs to be restrictions applied and code of conduct and responsibility created so that these funds do not invest in uh, you know toxic uh, assets and as a result the money uh, you know of the consumer or the customer uh, whose savings are invested in this pension fund are not lost so there were changes done in this report in the hampel report which will majorly be important for the institutional investors so that when they invest they are making sure that they follow uh, you know corporate governance guidelines and code of practices which have been set in order to ensure the safety of the money being invested for long term returns uh, which are basically you know uh, the uh, the pension funds or pension money for a lot of employees in the public sector organization and even in the private sector organization now after the cadbury's report we also see global financial crisis happening and because of the global financial crisis happening what we see is that uh, you know a lot of countries in particular and banks in particular were regulated and there were lots of changes which were brought across in the financial system of the uh, you know uh, workings of the financial systems in most countries so in the uk if you see after the financial crisis the financial services authority the fsa was actually closed and a new uh, you know authority called financial conduct authority was asked was formed essentially and this was done primarily to ensure that uh, you know there is equal participation uh, from you know various uh, facets of the uh, you know the uh, the economy which is cbi the banks uh, the investors and also the members of general public to ensure that as a neutral body they were able to they are going to be able to ensure that this kind of a financial collapse does not happen in the future and then again we look at the reasons why you know financial conduct authority was created was that it wanted to avoid you know uh, uh, let's say closures of bank there are lots of closures of banks which happened during that point in time because the banks collapsed the money could not be recovered they lended money to organizations which had debt and this debt turned toxic which means no money was returnable and as a result you will see a lot of banks actually collapsed in the uk market and in general in european market and also across the world and in some cases the government had to come in and bail out these banks and that is why you know you would see corporate governance is very very important when it comes to you know ensuring and there are bodies within different countries so if we talk about your uk in general there's a body called financial conduct authority which looks at basically you know regulating all the financial institutions it writes the code of practice it writes uh you know the principles and the rules which need to be followed in terms of running these organizations and it holds the companies accountable uh, if they are to conduct any you know financial misconduct and that is what is important when we look at uh, you know corporate governance in the us uh, you know very briefly we see the beginnings of the uh, sox act or the oxley act which is generally considered the first initiative which you know the legislation of the parliament had taken in the us to actually regulate corporate governance or uh, you know set corporate governance standards 
for U.S. companies uh, or companies operating out of the U.S. And this particular reform, which was introduced, is also called, you know, the Public Company Accounting and Investment uh, Investor Protection Act. And along with this, the Corporate Accounting, uh, sorry, Corporate and Auditing Accounting Accountability and Responsibility Act, which was, which is now enshrined in the, uh, you know, in the legislation in the U.S., allows the companies uh, to, you know, uh, report financial irregularities before the accounts of the companies are submitted, you know, at the end of the year. So this is a very consequential, you know, outcome. You know, how the government has also realized, and financial institutions in the country have realized that, you know, that regulation needs to be put into place for managing and you know ensuring that corporate governance or the running of the day-to-day -day operations of the company actually follows some sort of a code of practice. And in the US, these are called rules because they are acts passed by the parliament. And in the UK and European geography, we see them as uh, procedures or you know principles which the companies have to adopt and create their own policies and follow these in the organization to, uh, you know, adapt their day-to-day -day working and ensuring that these, uh, you know, frauds or misrepresentation of fund, over-reporting of financial profits or, you know, things like for, uh, prime drink, things like money laundering and these kind of activities are negated and do not happen within companies. So, when you look at task 3.2, what the task 3.2 is asking us to do is primarily look at recommendations which would help us resolve problems of corporate governance and corporate social responsibility by referring to certain theoretical concepts. So here the example that you take has to be underpinned by the theory and that would allow you to make some recommendations of what were the problems and how these problems can be resolved by following the code of practice or the principles uh, you know, which have been set out in corporate governance and in a way allow the company to operate, uh, you know, under the limit of the financial, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, say for example, financial regulation, which is present within a particular country. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Any questions on today's uh, two tasks and questions that we've discussed? No. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, in in the in the Moodle, when you look at uh, primarily, what I've done is uh, obviously the presentation is all uploaded, but what I'm going to do is try and upload a handout for the Sarbanes Oxley Act, which is going to be available to you for additional reading. And in addition to this, what I'm going to do is also try and make available a couple of you know, uh, annual general reports. You know, when we talk about the report which companies come out with at the end of the year, and these annual okay. general reports you can go through. Like if I look at the, say, annual general report of, say, let's say a company, what company comes to your mind? Any company, give me a name of a company. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Any company, so. Let's say uh, British Telecom, right? Okay, any company, BT. So if I look at the uh, you know annual general report of BT, for example, you know what I want to do is look at their annual general report. Now, if I look at any company and annual general report, you will be able to see in the annual general report that there are uh, you know um, definitive areas in which the company has given an update about corporate social responsibility and their corporate governance structure. So if I look at this particular report, what I'm going, not going to do is go through this in detail, but let's do a quick search in terms of CSR. Let's see where they have mentioned anything about corporate social responsibility. Corporate social, okay, there's nothing about corporate social responsibility. So, if I look at this report and look at uh, our strategy, okay. So, if I look at going into a bit of detail in terms of this particular report, 
when it says investing into the future. You know, so here the company is talking about, you know, how it is going to be beneficial for uh, the society, for the environment, what kind of things it is looking at creating for customers. This is in general, you know, talking about, let's look at another one, Ammo General Report of Unilever. Or say Nestle. We all like chocolates, isn't it? So let's look at Nestle. Mm -hmm. So if I look at their annual general report, I want to see where is the PDF. So corporate governance, there you go. So if you see this particular report, you know, corporate governance, and we'll also look at, uh, you know, understanding this from a point of view of corporate social responsibility. So when you look at corporate governance here, you will get to see that, you know, every large organization, which has global operations, even looking at a company which is listed on a stock exchange, when they come out with their annual general report, there will be a section that you will see on corporate governance. So in order to understand mm -hmm. what they are doing for, you know, corporate governance in terms of their responsibilities towards their shareholders, towards their employees, how do they look at investing their capital profits, which the company generates, where how much reserves they maintain. You know, this will be giving you a bit of reading in terms of how the compensation of the directors are decided, how much raise can the directors in the company get, what is the salary which most of the top uh, management team is getting. And this is called transparency because a lot of organizations have been asked to publish the compensation their chairman, their top, the management actually receives. So this would allow you to understand the compensation of directors, you know, and how many times it is uh, for a normal employee in the organization and non-executive director. So this should be a bit of a reading that you, I would suggest, should look at, at least going through, because Nestle is a very big company. You might choose a local company in Malta and see what kind of report they publish and that will inform you about, you know, corporate governance. Then the other thing that you need to look at is corporate social responsibility. Now, some companies might not list it as CSR. So in this case, when you look at, you know, on their website, they have listed it as creating shared values and meeting our commitments progress report. So this is essentially their commitment towards society, environment in general, and the planet. Do you remember the triple bottom line that we spoke about? So if you see for the planet, for the community, and for the individual, so here they are using the three Ps of people, planet, and uh, you know, um, what was the third one? People, planet, triple bottom line. Any idea? So you look at the three Ps of the triple bottom line. It's people, planet, and what are the three parts? So we look at, you know, people, planet, and what is the third part? Do you recall? No. What is it? The, you know, in the triple bottom line concept, three TBL as we called it, there were three things that we defined, you know, which all companies are asked to you know, look into. And they talk about the triple bottom line wherein the companies are held accountable. So what they are held accountable for is, is for profits they make, people, the responsibilities they have towards their stakeholders, and the last is their planet. So when you look at this particular report, you will see that they have published things about how much profit they are making, how they are making, where the profits are being invested. Then they talk about people and their commitment to people in communities, and they talk about the planet. So here you would see that they are talking about, when I talk about profit, they're talking about something called creating shared value. That means they are sharing the benefits of the company's profit they make with the communities, with the employees. And also, you know, in some cases, when you hear of things like, if you work for Google, and if you uh, say, for example, if you work for Google for a number of years, I don't know the exact uh, number of years, but if you work for Google and if you pass away, then what tends to happen is the company actually will sponsor your child's education till the age of 18, which is basic schooling, and you will receive half of the salary that you would have received when you were alive 
for the time the child is growing up and, and the expenses are being paid so that it does not put financial burden on the partner or your spouse or the other half when uh, you know if if you pass away or if you have an abrupt uh, you know end in terms of your life so there are lots of these policies which different organizations have created and they show that they are following the triple bottom line or the corporate social responsibility one of the models that we study in the csr uh, you know carol's pyramid triple bottom line as we talked about elkinton's uh, you know triple bottom line concept so here the companies are following these guidelines to ensure that they are returning something back to the society returning something back uh, you know to the people and the community and also taking care of you know the planet in terms of environmentally friendly so the idea would be to try and go through some of these reports which you can which will help you also understand the two assessment criteria which are uh, you know in this particular last learning outcome okay okay good stuff so any questions on this so far perfect okay now because what i've done is i have also covered and given you guidelines primarily to look at how you would need to do your assignment right mm -hmm. yes so essentially what i think is we don't need to do a specific session to discuss the assignment brief because you know exactly how you know you're going to attempt the assignment as well or do you want to do a session yes yeah so you know how to do it or do you want me to do a session tomorrow for the assignment so to be honest there is no there is no need because i already started with the assignment uh, and uh, i still have uh, something to and then i will finish so there is no need that's fine okay so we'll skip tomorrow session and i know that next week we are starting off with another unit which is taxation principles week after that and practice mm -hmm. which is start 22nd we cannot change it to 16 we are coming in 